Good morning and happy Sabbath. This is our last Sabbath school panel, so we'll try to make this as fun as possible. And please join us from, uh, from the internet, wherever you are. We are hoping that you come in and join us here in person, but if you're not, please make an effort to join us online on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, we hope to see you, and please interact with us as well. Let's pray. Dear uh, we come to you this morning, stretch out. Lord, we ask that you open our minds, you open our hearts. As we study your word this morning, you give us the wisdom. Let us discuss what it is you want us to discuss. Let us let the people know what you want them to know. Lord, we ask for your wisdom. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, before we start this, let me introduce the panel. You already know them, but I love to introduce them again from today, since this is our last Sabbath school panel. That does not mean we're not going to have Sabbath school. We will still have Sabbath school, but the conventional way we used to have it, beginning next year. To my left is Brother Dante, our internal scholar. Uh, to my far right is Sister Barbara Lee. To her left is Sister Irene Moore. And I'm George Lurley. Thank you for joining us this morning. Our subject here is a little warm, isn't it? I don't know, it's just me, but it's a little warm. <clears throat> our subject here this morning is, uh, our lesson says, the title of our lesson is The Resurrection of Moses. When you think about resurrection, it's not Moses you talk about, but the, 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 the title is a little strange. So we will explain, we will get to what the resurrection of Moses is. But before we get there, we will be reading in this week in our study, Numbers, Deuteronomy. In fact, this whole, this whole study, this, this quarter has been about Deuteronomy, book, the book of Deuteronomy. And who's the author of Deuteronomy? Moses. And he is, the, fin the final chapter this morning will be on Moses. Our memory text, let me read our memory text to get us started. Yet Micah and Archangel, the Archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not to bring against him a revealing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Joel 9 and King, King, uh, New King James Version. Okay. Yeah, Jude. Jude, Jude 9. You know, Jude, it, it, that's it. it's a small book. I don't even think it has a chapter in it. It's only one chapter. One chapter, so they just say Jude 9. <laughs> yeah, you assume that's, that, that, that's the verse. Yes. Okay. Uh, like I like to do to read this passage. Uh, don't you? I will ask you to read this passage if you can. Uh, right below there. As we have seen all corner, Moses is the central mortal in Deuteronomy. His life, his character, his messages pervade the book. Though, yes, Deuteronomy is about God and his love for Am Yisrael, the people of Israel, God often used Moses to reveal that love and to speak to his people Israel. Now, as we come to the end of the quarter, the end of our study of Deuteronomy, we also come to the end of Moses' life, uh, at least his life here. As Ellen G. White expressed it, Moses knew that he was to die alone. No earthly friend would be permitted to minister to him in his last hours. There was a mystery and awfulness about the scene before him, from which his heart sank. The severest trial was his separation from the people of his care and love, the people with whom his interest and his life had so long been united, but he had learned to trust in God, and with unquestioning faith he committed himself and his people to his love and mercy. Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 470 and 471. As Moses' life and ministry revealed much about the character of God, so too does his death 
and resurrection. Uh, now, let me, let me finish this and then we can discuss it. The scene of Moses, part one. Oh, no, let's, let's discuss this one before we get to the scene of Moses. What we see here, according to Moses, I'm okay? All right, great, thank you. Now, Moses that I've done all of these things, it, it says here his death was kind of a lonely death. Well, God was there with him a part of the time ago. Maybe he left him and then he died. I don't know, which, which we aren't really told, are we, in the Bible? Uh, but but um, anyway, uh, further in the lesson, it seems that God was with him and told him he was going to go to sleep. Took him up on that mountain, Nebo, was it Mount Nebo? Can you hear me now? No, it's they turned it off. It was okay. Okay. No, that's all right. Go ahead. Continue. Anyway, uh, so, yes, uh, he, uh, he did die there, I suppose, alone, but God was there with, with him for a while. <coughs> Go ahead, you speak. Maybe he'll get that fixed. Okay, you can add on to it. You know, um, <clears throat> it's very interesting to note how it mentions that Moses died, uh, well, physically speaking alone, without anybody to, to be with him, such as Joshua, for example. You know, it reminds me in uh, 1 Kings 19, when Elijah was uh, chased, or well, he fled the town when... Queen Jezebel wanted to kill him, God was able to speak to him in the mountain, and he explained that he doesn't speak to us through these uh, big miracles and whatnot, such as fire coming down or mountains crashing. Oftentimes, the Lord speaks to us through a still, small voice. So I found it very interesting, and I believe that even today, uh, we are able to best hear God in times of thought and meditation and in prayer and quiet time. Not just in the work done here in the church. Uh, well, I wanted to say something real quick. <laughs> yes. We uh, they talked about Moses dying alone. I dare say a lot of people, and I know it's it's emphasizing here the way Moses was going to die because of things. But most people die by themselves. You, you nobody's going to nobody can die with you. I mean. Especially through the epidemic, you know, a lot of people were left in, in their beds and they had to die by themselves. Yeah. So it's not unusual for someone to die alone. No, uh, what, I, what I wanted to add here was, from our human point of view, Moses died alone. I think that's the human emotion that's been expressed. But if you look, Moses was buried. Moses didn't bury himself. It was God. So Moses didn't die alone. He was in the presence of God when he died. So I, I, I wanted to add that this was our human emotion being expressed here that he died alone. Yes. Actually, in inspiration, we're told he did die alone. Um, but it is to exemplify our Lord Jesus Christ. What happened with the disciples? They fled, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a symbolism, and this is what one of the things that the author of the lesson, as well as uh, the servant of the Lord, tries to ex ex exemplify to us, mm -hmm. that when it comes to moments like that, as you express, some people have died alone, without a family member or any sort of uh, 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 companionship. But in this sense, it was to exemplify our Lord. He, uh, he was... He was by himself. The disciples left him. Yes, the Lord was with him. It was sustained. Uh, our Lord was sustained and comforted by an angel. So see, the pattern fits. And this is one of the things that the lesson tries to bring to mind. And it's, uh, you'll see it as the lesson develops. But this is the, the, the focal point that in the introduction of the Sabbath, it tries to bring to us a pattern that 
the life, the, the, the last days, uh, or last moments of our Lord, you know, of, of Moses was this very similar to our Lord's. That's what it was. And even in the sense of a resurrection, who called Moses, as we saw the memory text, when we see in, in the resurrection of our Lord and, and also registered in inspiration, um, we hear an angel that we read that an angel said, Jesus, thy father calleth thee. And so, see, um, very, very similar par parallels. And that's what I saw in this. Yeah, I, I don't want us to get too much ahead of us here. Uh, because we'll cover all of that. This is a little bit. Well, God has reasons for everything he does. We yes. don't always understand it, but in the Bible, eventually we do see. And, and when we get to heaven, we will find out all the reasons and why he's what for things. Sister Barbara, while you have the mic, continue with the sins of Moses. Could you read that little passage? And then continue to Numbers 21 to 13, if you can. Okay. Uh, time and again, even amid their apostasy, and wilderness wanderings, God miraculously provided for the children of Israel. That is, however undeserving they were and often remained that way. God's grace flowed out to them. We too today are recipients of his grace, however much we are undeserving of it as well. After all, it wouldn't be grace if we deserved it, would it? And besides the abundance of food that the Lord had miraculously provided for them in the wilderness, another manifestation of his grace was the water, without which they would quickly perish, especially in dry, hot, and desolate desert. Talking about that experience, Paul wrote, All the what drink the same all drank the same spiritual drink. For they, they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Ellen White adds, wherever in their journeys they wanted water, there was there from the clefts of the rock, it gushed out beside their encampment. Numbers 21 to 13. Be, be, before you oh. get to that, I wanted to ask a question. What is the symbolism of that rock? Jesus is the symbol of the, the rock symbolizes Jesus. Is my mic working now? Yeah, it okay. is. As well as the food, because yes. Jesus is our food. He's our water. He's our everything. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you can continue now. Okay. Um, numbers no. 20, 1 through 13. 13. Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zain, in the first month, and the people stayed at Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. That was Moses' sister. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought up? the assembly of the Lord into the wilderness that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain and figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and they fell on their faces and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before your eyes and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give the drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. 
Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not be bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. This was the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel contended with the Lord, and he was hallowed among them. Well, this discussion, let's dis now let's discuss, uh, let's discuss the sin of Moses. What from this, from the passage read prior to Numbers 20 and getting into 20, what are the sins, what are the things that Moses did wrong there? Well, um, first of all, he assumed the authority that belonged only to God. And that was? He struck the rock and he says, shall we take, bring water out of this rock? He, he did not bring the water out of the rock. No matter what he did, it still came out. God yes. sent the water. The people needed the water. But he was not the one that brought the water out of the rock. Anything you want to add? Well, I was being kind of obstinate when I read this. Because in as part of the lesson, it was talking about him not having faith. But I believe my way of thinking, which I'm not the Bible and everything, but he had faith in Jesus and God doing what he said he would do. Mm -hmm. And he was so angry and ah, these people, ah, you know. And so in his anger, he disobeyed God. He hit the rock. He was only supposed to speak to it. And even if he don't hit it once, but he'd only, he hit it twice. Why was it wrong for him to hit the rock twice to start with? Because, because that was, because that was not what the Lord instructed him to do. He right. instructed him, as Sister uh, Irene said, instead of speaking to it. That's what the Lord instructed him: speak to the rock. Okay. He struck the rock, okay. and it was the same thing as we got. At, you know, it seems might go off, but it's really brief. Like uh, uh, Cain and Abel their offering one was one did according to the lord the other one did it okay nonetheless both of them took an offering here's the same thing moses though he did he did use a rod but did not do as the lord instructed well, well, him well, he was told yeah and at that moment sister barbara <laughs> that's where he lost faith it's not that moses was unfaithful but at the moment was he was unfaithful at the moment. He distrusted because just like Sister mentioned, and that verse does tell, tell us that he says, must we, as you know, we can see that he's glorifying self rather than okay. God. And that's a sign, a characteristic of faithless person. You have anything to add? Yes, sir. And to add on to that, <laughs> it also gave the children of Israel an occasion or an excuse for their uh, their murmurings and for their rebellion yeah, because as we see point. as we see throughout the five books of Moses or for example in Exodus and in especially in Numbers many of the children of Israel they would when they were complaining claim that it was Moses and Aaron or mainly Moses in particular that was leading them out of Israel mm -hmm. and that God had no agency in the matter as inspiration tells us um, so when Moses said, must we fetch you out water, it only reaffirmed them in this belief. And as we see further on, I don't want to go too far ahead. The Lord had to make very clear to them that that wasn't the case by forbidding Moses to go into the promised land with them as a way of explaining to them that it was he that was leading them and not Moses. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, another symbolism of hitting the rock twice. The rock was hit once, and that was Christ. Yes. He was resurrected once. You cannot raise him up twice. He's not going to die again. That was one other symbolism that I got. He spoiled the symbolism, yes. Yes. Okay, anything before we move on? So, scene part two. Irene, 
Yes. Could you lead us into that one? The uh, Sin of Moses, part two. Part two. I'd like you to read <clears throat> uh, according to the text and then conclude it with uh, Numbers 20, verse 8. Okay. Well, I tell it verses 9 to 11. Can I say something real quick? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Uh, that just shows us that we, in our anger, can cause a lot of problems <laughs> in ourselves. I mean, it bothers us, but it hurts other people, too. And that's how come when we get angry and upset like that, we have to call on God. To, oh, please help me not to be like this. Mm -hmm. Because it's so easy to get there and <clears throat> at people, you know, or, or even a dog or something. <laughs> you know, people go around and kick a dog when the dog's just a dog, you know. <laughs> Why you think people tell mothers if you're angry, or parents if you're angry, even if you're angry with your children, give yourself a little bit of time before you, you spank them. Because in your anger at the time, you're spanking them, you might do more than you intend to do. Right. So take time off, and then come back and give them the punishment. And that's where it was with Moses. He did yes. not intend to do the, what he did, no. but no. he did it, and that's where his punishment had to come. All right. You want me to read Numbers 20, 12, and 13? Uh, before you get to Eric, uh, I want you to read the, the, the same part uh, according to this text. The part down below? Yeah. According to this text, there was more to Moses' sin than his own attempt to take the place of God, which was bad enough. He also showed a lack of faith, which for someone like Moses would be inexcusable after all. This is the man who from the burning bush onward had had, unlike most people, an experience with God, and yet according to the text, Moses did not believe me. That is, Moses showed a lack of faith in what the Lord had said, and as a result, he had failed to hallow me before the children of Israel. In other words, had Moses kept his calm and done the right thing, by showing his own faith and trust in God amid their apostasy, he would have glorified the Lord before the people and been, again, an example to them of what true faith and obedience were like. Notice, too, how Moses had disobeyed what the Lord told him specifically to do, and we've talked about that yes. in some detail. Mm -hmm. So then uh, Numbers 20, 12, and 13 says... 9 to, 9 to 11. Oh. I know she read that before. You oh, just I see. Okay. It. You want the numbers below. 9 to 11. Okay. So, excuse me. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. Moses and Aaron Gerald gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, here now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice in his, um, I'm sorry, I lose my place. His, um, struck the rock. Then Moses lifted his hand, struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly in the congregation, and, and their animal. animals drank. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's what we were discussing. I think we, we, we delved into this a yeah. little bit, but I will ask mm -hmm. the question again. What specific reason did the Lord give to Moses for not for why he couldn't go over because of what he did? What specific reason the Lord gave to Moses that he could not cross the Jordan? Yeah. Well, in verse 12, of course, we have our answer. I believe there's more to it than just this, but the main answer was because Moses did not believe him to sanctify him in the eyes of the children yeah. of Israel. He did not hallow him. Yes. Hallow him yeah, That's him. correct. And I want to, want to add, this, this, this particular, the ending is, is, is easier compared to the previous lesson that we've had. This lesson explains itself and we all can relate to it because we heard the story so many times it's right there in our faces mm -hmm. and we just all we're doing is just repeating it and saying it out loud 
It's a really good story that we all know. If you know anything of the Bible, the Moses story, you know, bringing the children out of Egypt tells you all about this is where you start from. And we just repeating it. I think it was it's beautiful when I was reading this lesson. It brought back memory because you, you tend to, to, to delve into what's in front of you and forget sometimes some of the, the, the things you read in the past. And when I started reading this, it brought a whole lot of memory to me. Yes, sister. And it emphasizes also about we are to have faith in God and obey him no matter what happens. Whether we like what's going to happen or whatever, we have to obey in every way. <clears throat> It's so easy to kind of, well, he'll let me buy this time or something. But we can't look at it that way. There's a guy that said, well, the Bible said we live by what? Faith, not by sight. We, the kind of human being in us, we want to believe what we smell, see, and hear. But the Lord said we live by faith, not by sight, not by right. what we do. Yes. And also, we have to remember that there are other people watching, other, your children, as you grow, you know, if they grow up and you're teaching them, if you do certain things, they're watching. Hmm, mom did that, and she didn't get in trouble, but she wants to get after me because I did such and such, you know, or whatever. And we have to be careful of that because it doesn't work that way. <laughs> we have to be an example to people around us. And, and, uh, and our children, our families, everybody, our neighbors, our church family, we have to be a good example. Why that is important that, you know, you gotta watch what people, you gotta make sure that people are watching. I think if we do that, then we'll be, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not living God's will. We need to live right by God and that, we explain who we are and not wanting, because if we live right, the people around us see us. We don't have to be doing it for them. We're doing it because God said it's right for us to do it. And they will see it from us, from our example. We're not doing it for them. We're doing it for God. Right. That's we have true. to make sure that, that they know. Yes. I'm not being able to do this myself. Only God's in me working to Amen. make me be able to be calm and, right. and do things the right way. Not me, because yes. I know me. <laughs> uh, and it is possible to conquer anger. Yes. I was an angry person many times in my life uh, to regret and have to apologize and so forth. But God, you know, I'm not that person anymore. It's wonderful Amen. to be able to. I tell to, myself, you know, I says. That he has the flow now. <laughs> He can, he can get to him when he's done. Thank you, Elder George. And, you know, just to add on to what Sister Barbara mentioned earlier, um, you know, I remember I was reading this chapter in Patriarchs and Prophets by the name of the Smitten Rock that actually goes into the sin of Moses in Numbers 20. And there's a little passage from the, from the book which reads this. Past faithfulness will not atone for one wrong act. The greater the light and privileges granted to man, the greater is his responsibility. The more aggravated his failure and the heavier his punishment. I remember I was reading this chapter and this was actually the hardest one that I ever had to read because I saw Moses, this faithful man of God, sin and because of this supposedly one small tiny sin, he's left out of the land and I felt angry at Sister White and I felt angry at God and I was just saying Lord why would you do such a thing but as I calm down and as I get to go into this chapter especially when I was face to face with this during the week it helped me realize something about God and it is that as we've learned in previous lessons he's no respecter of persons That's true. because he was essentially saying listen I love you I've shown you all these things but I need to judge you and to punish you according to the light that you have received. You know, there are many of us here, I'm very, you know, 17 years of age, and some of you have, with all due respect, been around longer than I have, and it is, of course, evident that God has revealed more to you than he has to me throughout your lifespan. And what I'm getting at 
is that God will judge all of us according to what he has shared with us and what he has revealed unto us in his word. So, and Before I get to you, <laughs> there's a saying, to whom much is given, much is expected. Right. So Moses, there were much more expected of Moses than you know you and I yes, yes. and us because he read, talks about us older folks we've had longer to learn lessons too and so we are more should be more responsible in things but I also want a little say I've tried to tell myself Barbara if you don't want to have to go back and say you're sorry to somebody just watch your mouth <laughs> because if you get to thinking about what you said later you got to go back and say I'm sorry and that's hard to do so just don't say it in the first place <laughs> no okay we got anything else to add before we go on to Tuesday You know, this is really good because most of the time in our lesson at this time, we just stay on Monday <laughs> and we're on Tuesday. That means we're going to get farther this time. Well, uh, well, I thought it was interesting that we brought out that Moses did not d die of disease. No. He did. Uh, he, it says that he was, his, even though he was 120 years old, uh, his vigor was not reduced. No. His vision apparently was perfect. Uh, and you know he was apparently still strong like a young man so I thought so then that why was, did he die he died because God thought it was time for him to die and only God you know we don't question why God did that uh, yes. he said I have caused you uh, I think if we, before we leave Tuesday it, it mm -hmm. brings out here in the note that um, God actually showed him the promised land so he did get to see it Maybe that made it even harder, I don't know, because he wasn't going to go over to it. And now that was a miracle, because there's no way he could have seen the promised land except as God opened up his vision to see it. And it was like a vision that he saw, I guess, of a promised land, because his eyes weren't that good that he could see clear down there and, you know, all the, the Israelites. Well, I think that there. was the miracle. Yes. Because I know they said his vision was not impaired. I mean, his right. vigor was still there. But to see, I mean, I'm, I don't know how good your eyes are. Even with a vernacular, I can't see from here to, uh, to my house <laughs> if, <Right>. if I'm <laughs> high up there. But it, the, the miracle is somehow God was able to let him see yes. everything. Yeah. And like the way it would be. And, yes. and, you know, and so he got to see it even though he didn't get to go in that, sh that showed his love for Moses yes yes the other, the other thing it's uh, just adding to what uh, uh, sister Irene is saying it kind of takes us back to the beginning of the lesson um, in him they not uh, they were at the brink of the, land, the promised land that's one of the reasons why he had to die Mm -hmm. They were, you know, what the Lord called to Moses, called Joshua and so forth. We know those details. We don't need to get into that. But the point here is they were at the brink of a promised land. Therefore, Moses could not go any further. Right. And, and that was a place uh, apparently to, to the Lord's will and his plan that Mount Nebor was a perfect place to have Moses die there. Um, the other thing that is very amazing is this. Although it seems unfair, as Dante mentioned, that frustra frustration kicked, kicked in, uh, and some people are, oh, well, God is unfair. Why would he want to not let him in just because of that? Well, as we've been seeing, sometimes just certain things that the Lord does not allow us to have here, that does not mean he will not grant us eternal life. It's just the certain things, as the psalmist says, thy commandments, thy judgments, and thy laws are just. So there's nothing, absolutely nothing that the Lord does for us and in us that is an unfair thing. For us seems to. But who are we and what is our understanding according to his judgment? It's meaningless. He's, he's perfect. 
And so that's one of the things that I love about this experience that we can actually find in the experience of Moses. The judgment of the Lord was fair, was just, because it was about trusting him, obeying him on what he had done. And here's another thing, and make it very brief. Had he allowed Moses to continue on, one of the, these two nice ladies made, mentioned earlier, if he had continued, the people would have continued to give the glory to Moses rather than to God. And so in itself, you see a lot of blessings all around, as well as for Moses, as much as for the people of Israel and for our day. Down to? The echo. <laughs> the echo, yeah. Deuteronomy 34, verses 1 to 12. Yes, I'll do, George. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 34, starting at verse 1. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho. And the Lord shewed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah unto the utmost sea, and the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho, of <clears throat> the city of palm trees unto Zoar, and the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. And Moses was an hundred and twenty years old when he died, and his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days, so the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. And in all that mighty hand and in all the great terror which Moses shewed in the sight of all Israel. Yes, this passage explains what we were discussing earlier about Moses, uh, that is Vigas, was said that he was a strong man, even though he was 120. His eyes were good, he was still strong, but God took him. The question that I have is, if Moses died, who wrote the rest of, uh, <laughs> who completed the rest of Deuteronomy? <laughs> who, who did it? Who wrote, who wrote the rest of the book? Well, we don't know, because we're not told, but assuming it probably was Joshua is what I'm thinking. Well, Moses could have. God could have told him what's going to happen. Because well, he told well, him that you're going to die alone. He knew he was going to die alone and yes, everything. There was more to the book. Than well, I didn't just say there's statement. more to it than that. So, <laughs> But I wanted to make a real quick thing here. Yeah. How I was talking about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, how God had sworn the land to them. And that was something in itself because God talked to each one of those men. You know, when Jacob went and ran away and then the ladder came down and he says this land is you know he told them all along even before they went over to Egypt when Joseph was over this land is going to be yours yours and so Mo he they were re he was reaffirming it to Moses that it will happen as I said it will you won't be there but it will happen just yeah. as I told you it would be all right. Why do you think God took the time to show to, 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 to Moses before? Because he loved him and he knew how much he wanted to go. So he gave him the privilege to see what's going to happen, even though he couldn't go. Yes. He, that, gives, us, he gives us many treats as it goes along. You know, I don't know about you, but I know in my life, I thought, well, I'm not going to get this. And then all of a sudden, boom, I get a special treat, you know. And I said, that's, thank you, Father, because yes. there are special things that he does for us. He knows how much we want certain things and what's best and what isn't. 
And also we talked about dying and stuff. You know, some of us are not going to be able to go through some of the things that are ahead. So he puts us to sleep so we can go through it without all the what would, might happen otherwise. And he has his reasons for everything. And that's all we have to know is that God knows what's best for me. What my takeaway from this message here, from that particular Moses encounter there is no matter how you feel or how you're feeling at the time or what, what you did, how bad you think you did, God always love you. Yes. You haven't done, you, I don't care what you do, you cannot do anything to a point that he will stop loving you. That's and he true. showed that to Moses. No matter what, Moses had done all of these things. And the one thing, you know, one of the things that he was not supposed to do, he did. And God still loved him. The only thing he did was he was not going to go there. But look, this is where you brought your people. This is where they're going to go. See it before you close your eyes. That's why Jesus came to this earth. So we could be forgiven for our sins and be going with him to heaven. Okay, let's let's continue. George, yes. The other thing, it's just and it's emphasized a little bit in the beginning. One of the things in in the character of Moses is the love that Moses had grown to have for the people. That's that's one of the things that perhaps what catches a lot of people off guard by saying, you know, but why? After all this, well, the Bible tells us, I think it's in the book of Ezekiel, all our past <laughs> righteousness does not justify one sin. It is only Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so Moses had so much love for, for, for the people as he did for God as well, because he loved them. Uh, he served them and obeyed them in s such a special way that to him, we find we found through the quarterly how even he interceded for the people, and so just so we can see this uh, development in this as to one of the reasons also um, for allowing him to view the, the 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 promised land. Here, look at it. This is what I promised your fathers. And because that relationship, that bond that they had for uh, with each other, the Lord with Moses and Moses with him, that's one of the things that we can also find here. The Lord helps us to view glimpses of future things that he has promised us that we may not, probably may not get to experience, but in his love, He's given it to us to encourage us and refresh us. As you said, no matter what, He loves us so dearly. There's, there's no doubt about Moses' love for the people. That's what got him to flee Egypt in the first place. Because somebody tells the story, Gary, enlighten us, what got Moses to leave? What? Say that again. What got Moses to leave Egypt? Why did he leave Egypt? Yeah. Well, he was really forced to leave, wasn't he, at the time? Yeah. Sort, because of sort what he of. had done. He was, <laughs> he was uh, upset because he saw his people. He, rec he had started to associate more with his own people, apparently, mm -hmm. and the problems that they were having with the Egyptians. And he saw this Egyptian beating one of them, and he was, became angry. He had that problem apparently with anger at times, and he struck the Egyptian and killed him. And of course, when that became known because somebody had seen I, uh, who had d done it and the word is spread, when that became known, he knew he had to leave. Yeah. He was in trouble with the, uh, with the uh, Egyptians, so. Well, I mean, that's, I, I wanted you to explain that story so it refreshes our mind. Uh, Moses is a great man. He, Moses was a baby that was, uh, you know, turned over to uh, the, 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 uh, the Pharaoh's daughter. And the Pharaoh's daughter, I mean, it's a really beautiful story. The Pharaoh's daughter asked Moses' mom, not knowing Moses' mother, to take care of Moses. 
So, he, Moses, so Moses had some time with his mother that taught him the way of the people. But Moses had another, I don't know how many years in the palace, learning the way of the Egyptians. He was, he was taught to practically be a pharaoh. Yes. And, but, and to lead a yeah, leader. Yeah, a military leader. But with all of that, that little seed that was planted by his mother did not leave him. And Moses' anger, as you can tell through this story, Moses is a human being of habit. He's a creature of habit. His anger that got him out of Egypt, his anger got him to not see the promised land as well. At the same time, I believe he needed to get out of Egypt yes. because uh, he had to unlearn a lot of things that uh, he had learned there. And uh, to herding sheep, I guess, was is a difficult job. <laughs> they yeah. become they humble all go their own way. From an arrogant prince uh, yes. to being a humble shepherd, yes. to be able to, to cope with these right. Israelites he was going to have to take out. Good description. That's, I think that's exactly what he was. So, You know, and Paul also tells us in Hebrews 11, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of, of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the riches or the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto, unto the recompense of, of the reward. He looked beyond the gorgeous palace, beyond a monarch's crow, crown, to the high honors that will be bestowed on the saints of the Most High in a kingdom untainted by sin. He saw by faith an imperishable crown, that the kingdom of heaven would place on the brow of the overcomer. And that's Patriarchs and Prophets, page 246. Wow. Now, anything to add before we move on to the resurrection of Moses Wednesday? Anybody? Okay. It's just the same pattern as I was saying. You know, if you read, if someone can read Hebrews 12, verses 1, 2, and 3, it's a very, very straight parallel to what he just read in regards to our Lord Jesus Christ. See, the faith of Moses is parallel with what it, Paul writes about Jesus in Hebrews 12. Hebrews author, 12 what? Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, and I believe verse 3. The parallelism of what our Lord Jesus Christ... You want to read that? See, um, Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You see the parallelism right there. It's yes. so beautiful. It calls us to be kind of like Moses, you know, and see what our Lord Jesus Christ did. I just, that's one of the things that caught my attention about that. That's good. Well, Ari, <coughs> yes. I'd like for you to, to read this, uh, the resurrection. Let's start on Wednesday. Yes. The resurrection. The first part under. Yeah. So, and, I mean, you can read the entire page if you want. Uh, okay. Yeah. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows his grave to this day. That's Deuteronomy 34, 5 and 6. Thus, with these few verses, Moses, so central to the life of Israel, a man whose writing lives on as well, died. But also, even in the church and in the synagogue today as well, um, died. Moses died and was buried. The people mourned, and that was that. Certainly, the principle of the words of Revelation applies here. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, from now on, yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. However, Moses' death 
was not the final chapter in the story of Moses' life. Okay. Uh, though we're given only a glimpse with an incredible scene is, de is depicted here. Michael, Christ himself, disputes with the devil about the body of Moses. Disputed over it how? There's no doubt that, doubt, excuse me, that Moses was a sinner indeed, his last known sin, the taking of himself of glory that was God's, was this same kind of sin. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High that got Lucifer himself thrown out of heaven in the first place. The dispute over Moses' body must have been because Christ was now claiming for Moses the promised resurrection. How could Christ do that for a sinner, Moses, someone who had violated his law? The answer, of course, could only be the cross. Just as all the animal sacrifices point ahead to Christ's death, so obviously the Lord now, looking ahead to the cross, claimed the body of Moses to be resurrected. In consequence of sin, Moses had come under the power of Satan. In his own merits, he was death's lawful captive. But he was raised to immortal life, holding his title in the name of the Redeemer. Moses came forth from the tomb glorified, ascended with his deliverer to the city of God. That's in Patriarchs and Prophets. <clears throat> the, the question I ask down here is how does this account of Moses help us to understand the death, the death of the plan of salvation that even before the cross, Moses could be raised to immortality. Mm -hmm. Before we get to that, you see the devil argument? The, uh, uh, he's trying to compare Moses' uh, sin to his sin. What is the difference there between him and Moses? He didn't repent. <laughs> he didn't Moses repent. did. Yes, sir. You know, and I, I do not want to detract from this, but um, inspiration also tells us in Mount of Blessing, page 57, Christ himself, when cont contending with Satan about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation. That's in Jude 9. Had he done this, he would have placed himself on Satan's ground. <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my space. For accusation is the weapon of the evil one. Yes. He is called in scripture the accuser of our brethren. That's Revelation 12, verse 10. Jesus would employ none of Satan's weapons. He met him with the words, the Lord rebuke thee. Well, I mean, Satan knows the Bible. How did he attack Christ? You read from the Bible. It is written. Yes. <laughs> it misquoted him, but. He misquoted him. <laughs> purposely. But, yes. So he knows the Bible, and what that tells me is we need to know our Bible. There will come a time that we will be challenged. We should be able to defend our faith through the Word. Yes, sir. The other thing, the other thing is that he instigated that sin into Moses. Yes. That, that's a difference right there. Satan, that was of himself. Yes. was mentioned. But to Moses, if we find, if we see the, the situation, time and time again, the people of God were murmuring against God. Not only about Moses, and Moses understood they were murmuring about against God, mm -hmm. whom he loved, and 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 he had heard. Did did you not see what 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 I did in Egypt from the Lord? And he had to repeat that message to them, mm -hmm. and so eventually his patience broke down but instigated by Satan it doesn't mean that we're excusing we just seen the difference between the two and the cross as it was read by inspiration it was the cross that defended Moses Satan did not allow himself in fact we're told by inspiration that was a reason even though he, one of the reasons why he could not remain in heaven it was because he had already planted that seed. Yes. And that controversy could not be in heaven at all. And so that's that's another thing that we can find in here as, as to the difference between the, the sin of Moses and the sin of Satan. We're running out of time. Yeah, I need to I want to get to Thursday. Uh, Barbara, <clears throat> did you want to say something? 
Well, okay, then you got your microphone. You may as well read for us on Thursday. Okay. What you want? The resurrection of us all. The whole thing? Yeah, the whole page. Okay. So we can discuss it. It says, with the added light of the New Testament, the exclusion of Moses from the promised land doesn't seem like much of a punishment after all. Instead of an earthly Cana, and later an earthly Jerusalem, which for all its known history has been a place of war, conquest, and suffering, the heavenly Jerusalem is even now his home, a much better abode for sure. Moses was the first known example in the Bible of the resurrection of the dead. Enoch was brought to heaven without having seen death, and Elijah too. But as far as a written record goes, Moses was the first one to have been resurrection, resurrected to eternal life. How long Moses slept in the ground, we don't know, but as far as he was concerned, it didn't matter. He closed his eyes in death, and whether it was three hours or 300 years, for him, it was the same. It also is the same for all the dead throughout history. Their experience, at least as far as being dead goes, will be no different than Moses. We close our eyes in death, and the next thing we know is either the second coming of Jesus or, unfortunately, the final judgment. Without the hope of the resurrection, we have no hope at all. Christ's resurrection is the guarantee of ours having purged our sins. On the cross as our sacrificial. <laughs> sacrificial lamb, Christ died and rose from dead. And because of his resurrection, we have the surety of ours with Moses being the first example of a fallen human being raised from the dead. Because of what Christ would do, Moses had been raised. And because of what Christ has done, we too will be raised as well. Thus, we can find in Moses an example of salvation by faith, mm -hmm. a faith made manifest in a life of faithfulness and trust in God, even if he faltered at the end. All through the book of Deuteronomy, we will see Moses seeking to call God's people to a similar faithfulness, a similar response to the grace given to them as it has been given to us. We too, who are on the border of the promised land. Yes. Okay, I like, uh, Dante, could you close this by reading Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 13 to 22. This, that referred directly to all of us. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 13 to 22. We'll close with that. 15 through 22? Yes. Okay. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, that is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is, is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man cometh, came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Elder George, I just have one request. and I, If you wouldn't mind, I'd like to read a little bit from John. Not too much. Okay. No. Yeah. I'll make it very short. And it reads this. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Yeah, it's a, it's a good place to end today. It tells us Jesus doesn't even refer to death as death. He calls it sleep. This is, a, this is a reassurance to us that when we are dead, we are really sleeping until he comes. And the promise that those who go to sleep 
knowing him will be resurrected again. So we look forward to that. Irene, do you want to say something? I think we ought to make an announcement again that this is the last panel, since so some people probably signed in late. Yes. And yes, thank you, Irene, for reminding me. Uh, for the folks out there, today is our last panel for, you know, for this discussion. We are or will be returning to our normal uh, Sabbath school like we used to do before. Uh, so please come and be in attendance because we don't want, we, we call the teacher, but actually the person there is a moderator and he or she would need your participation to make the discussion better. It's called Sabbath School. We need all of us to be there. Please, come on time. Uh, could, you, could you close up for us in prayer? Loving Father, thank you so much for the wonderful lessons that we have uh, reviewed here again this morning and your dealings with the uh, children of Israel and especially as it relates to Moses and his leadership. And, so forth. We thank you, Lord, for that. We ask for your presence, the Holy Spirit, to continue to go with us as we go into our next service and keep us all safe. We pray in Jesus' loving name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.